You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collection of lectures, uh, volume 165 in Steiner's Collected Works, entitled Unifying Humanity Spiritually Through the Christ Impulse, Uh, translated by Christian von Arnhem, uh, 13 lectures held in Berlin, Dornach, Basel, and Bern between the 19th of December 1915 and the 16th of January 1916. Lecture 1, given in Berlin, on the 19th of December, 1915. Let us this day begin once again with with particular strength of devotion in our hearts by thinking of those who are posted out in the fields where the events are happening and who today have to devote their life and soul to the great tasks of our time. Quote, Spirits of your souls, active guardians, May your wings bear the beseeching love of our souls to the human beings on earth committed to your keeping, that, united with your power, our prayer may radiate in help to the souls it lovingly seeks. Close quote. And for those who have already passed through the portal of death in this time of grave human duties, as a result of the great demands of the present, let us say these words once more in the following form. Quote, Spirits of your souls, active guardians, may your wings bear the beseeching love of our souls to the human beings in the spheres committed to your keeping, that, united with your power, our prayer may radiate in help to the souls it lovingly seeks. Close quote. And the spirit we seek through our human stri- our spiritual striving, the spirit who went through the mystery of Golgotha for the salvation of the earth, for the freedom and progress of humanity, the spirit whom we should particularly remember today, that spirit be with you and your great duties. Let our thoughts turn to the verse ringing forth out of the profound secrets of earth development. Quote, Revelation of the divine in the heights of existence and peace on earth to human beings who are filled with goodwill. Close quote. And as Christmas approaches, there is something we must particularly reflect on this year. What sentiments unite us with this verse and its deep cosmic meaning? The deep cosmic meaning which many people feel in such a way that the word peace rings and sounds through it at a time in which peace avoids earth existence in the, to the greatest extent. How can we reflect in this time on the Christmas verse? But there is one thought which might touch us even more deeply at the present time than at other times in connection with this verse resounding through the world. One thought. Nations are facing one another in hostility. Our earth is soaked in blood, much blood. We have been forced to see, forced to feel many deaths around us. The atmosphere of sentiments and feelings weaves unending suffering around us. Hate and dislike flock through spiritual space and can easily show how far, far removed the people of our time still are from that love which the one whose birth is celebrated at Christmas wanted to proclaim. But there is one thought which particularly comes to the fore. We imagine how enemy can face enemy, opponent can face opponent, how people can bring death to one another, and how they can pass through the same portal of death with the thought of the divine light-bearer, Jesus Christ. We reflect how across the earth, throughout which war and pain and disunity are spreading, those who are otherwise so disunited can be in unity because they bear in the deepest depths of their heart their connection with the one who entered the world 
on the day we celebrated Christmas. We think of despite all hostility, all dislike, despite all the hate, a sentiment can penetrate human souls in these times, penetrate out of the midst of all the blood and hate, the thought of the intimate connection with the One, with Him who has united hearts with something that is higher than anything that can ever separate human beings on earth. And so, this is a thought of infinite magnitude, a thought of infinite depth of feeling, the thought of Jesus Christ uniting human beings, however much they may be disunited in all matters concerning the world. If we grasp the thought in this way, then we will want to grasp it all the more deeply in our present time in particular. Because when we will have a notion of how much is connected with this thought in terms of the things that must become large and strong and powerful within human development, so that much can be obtained in different ways by human hearts, by human souls, which at present must still be obtained in such a blood-soaked way, that he makes us strong, that he vitalize us, that he teach us across the earth to feel in the truest sense of the word the consecrated words of Christmas, despite all that separates us. That is what those who truly feel united with Jesus Christ must vow to themselves on Christmas Eve. There is a tradition in the history of Christianity which keeps recurring in later times and which, over centuries, became a custom in certain regions. In ancient times already, Believers in various regions had presented to them the had presented to them the mystery of Christmas, mostly by the Christian churches. In these most ancient times in particular, this presentation of the Christmas mystery began with a reading, sometimes even a presentation of the creation story, as it is set out at the beginning of the Bible. The first thing to be presented, particularly in the Christmas period, was how the cosmic word sounded from the depths of the cosmos, how creation gradually came about out of the cosmic word, how Lucifer approached the human being, and how as a result human beings started earth existence in a different way from the existence that was intended for them before Lucifer approached them. The whole story of the temptation of Adam and Eve was performed, And then it was shown how the human being was incorporated, as it were, into the whole of ancient pre-Testament history. Only then, in the further course of events, were the things added in plays in greater or lesser detail, which then in the 15th, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries developed into the plays of which we saw a little one just now. Little remains of that which in an infinitely great thought linked the start of the Old Testament with the secret story of the mystery of Golgotha in the Christmas festival, which combined those two stories in that thought. The only thing left today in that respect is that the feast day of Adam and Eve occurs in the calendar on the day before Christmas Day. That has its origin in the same thought. But in more ancient times a great, a comprehensively symbolic thought was presented to those who through their teachers and out of deeper thoughts, deeper feelings or a deeper knowledge were to grasp the secret of Christmas and the secret of Golgotha, the thought of the origin of the cross. The God who is presented to human beings in the Old Testament instructs the human beings represented by Adam and Eve that they may eat of all the fruits in the garden except the fruit on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were driven out of the original setting of their existence because they ate of it. But this tree, this was now represented in a great variety of ways, in some way came into the possession of the generations which were then also the original lineage from which the physical body of Jesus Christ emerged. And it happened, this is how it was presented at certain times, that when Adam was buried as a sinful human being, this tree which had been removed from paradise, grew out of his grave. 
Thus we see the thoughts suggested. Adam rests in his grave. He, the human being who passed through sin. He, the human being who was seduced by Lucifer. Rests in his grave and has united himself with the body of the earth. But the tree grows out of his grave. The tree which can now grow out of the earth with which Adam's body has been united. The tree of this wood continues down the generations, including Abraham, including David. And the wood of this tree which stood in paradise and which grew again out of Adam's grave, the wood of this tree was used to make the cross on which Jesus Christ hung. This was the thought which was made clear by their teachers to those who were to understand out of deeper foundations the secrets of the mystery of Golgotha. There is a deep meaning in the fact that in more ancient times, and we will shortly see in this meaning that it still holds good also in the present time, profound thoughts came to expression in such images. We have acquainted ourselves with the thought about the mystery of Golgotha, which tells us the being who passed through the body of Jesus distributed across the earth what he can bring to it, distributed it into the earth's aura. What Christ brought into the earth has since then been combined with the complete corporeality of the earth. The earth has turned into something else since the mystery of Golgotha. That which Christ brought down to earth from heavenly heights lives in the earth's aura. If together with that we cast our mind's eye, E-Y-E, on that ancient image of the tree, this image shows us the complete context from a higher vantage point. The Luciferic principle entered human beings as they started their earth existence. Human beings as they now are in their association with the Luciferic principle, belong to the earth, are part of the earth. And when we place their bodies into the earth, then that body is not just the thing that anatomy sees, but this body is at the same time the external cast of what is also contained inside physical human beings. It can be clear to us through spiritual science that it is not only what goes through the portal of death, into the spiritual world that belongs to the nature of the human being, but that human beings are united with the earth through all that they do, through all their deeds on earth, that they are truly united with it in the same way that those events are united with the earth which geologists, mineralogists, zoologists, and so on find connected with the earth. When human beings pass through the portal of death, The only thing that is closed off to the human individuality to begin with is what ties them to the earth. But we consign our outer form in some way to the earth. It enters the body of the earth. It carries within it the manifestation of what the earth has become because Lucifer entered earth development. What human beings do on earth bears the Luciferic principle within it. Human beings introduce this Luciferic principle into the earth's aura. It is not just what was originally intended with the human being that arises or blossoms from human deeds, from human activity. Human deeds give rise to what was mixed in with the Luciferic element. That is contained in the earth's aura. And when, on the grave of Adam, the human being seduced by Lucifer, we now see the tree which has become something different from what it was at the beginning because of Lucifer's seduction, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then we see everything that human beings have provoked because they left their original position, because they turned into something else through Lucifer's seduction and therefore introduced something to earth evolution that was not previously intended for them. We see the tree growing out of what the physical body is for the earth, what has been stamped into its earthly form, what makes human beings on earth appear in a lower sphere than what they would have become if they had not passed through the Luciferic seduction. Something grows out of the human being's whole earthly existence 
which has entered into human development through the Luciferic seduction, temptation. By seeking knowledge, we seek it in a different way to the one originally intended for us. But that means that what grows out of our deeds on earth is different from what it could be in accordance with the original decision of the gods. We shape an existence on earth that is not the same as the one determined for us by the original decision of the gods. We mix something else into it, which we have to think of in a very specific way if we want to understand it properly. We have to tell ourselves, I have been placed in earth development. That which I contribute to earth development through my deeds bears fruit. It bears fruits of knowledge which I have obtained because I have been given knowledge of good and evil on earth. This knowledge lives in the development of the earth. This knowledge is there. But in looking at this knowledge, it turns into something else for me from what it should originally have been. It turns into something else for me, which I must change if the goal of the earth and the task of the earth is to be achieved. I see something grow out of my deeds on earth which must change. The tree grows which becomes the cross of earth existence, the tree which becomes the thing to which human beings must develop a new relationship, because it is the old relationship that makes the tree grow. The tree of the cross, that cross which grows out of luciferically tinged earth development, grows out of Adam's grave, out of the kind of human nature which Adam has become after the temptation. The tree of knowledge must become the trunk of the cross, because human beings must unite with the properly perceived tree of knowledge, as it is now in order to achieve the goal of the earth, the task of the earth. Let us ask ourselves, and here we touch on an important secret of spiritual science, how is it with regard to the components which we have come to know as the elements of our human nature? Well, we know that our I, capital, is the initially highest component of human nature. We learn to say I to ourselves at a certain time during childhood, we enter into a relationship with this I from the time onward to which we can remember back in later years. We know from various spiritual scientific observations that up to that time the I itself acts in a formative and creative way in us up to the moment that we acquire a conscious relationship with our I. This I is also present in the child, but it is at work in us. It first forms the body in us. To begin with, it works with super-sensory forces from the spiritual world. Once we have passed through conception and birth, it continues to work for some time, which may be years, on our body, until we have our body as a tool so that we can consciously grasp ourselves as an I. A profound secret is associated with this entry of the I into human physical nature. We ask a person when we, meet, when we met him, How old are you? He tells us his age as the years which have passed since he was born. As I said, we touch on a certain secret of spiritual science here, which will become increasingly transparent to us in the coming time, but which I only want to raise to tell you about today. What a person tells us about his age at a certain time of his life only relates to his physical body. It tells us no more than that his physical body has developed for the period since his birth. The I is not involved in this development of the physical body. It remains stationary. And this is the secret which is so difficult to understand, that the I remains stationary at the point to which we can remember back. It does not change with the body. It remains stationary. That, precisely, is the reason why we always have it before us, why it reflects our experiences back to us when we look into it. 
the eye does not join us on our earthly journey. Only when we have passed through the portal of death do we have to take the return path we call Kama Loka to our birth to meet our eye again and take it with us on our further journey. The body takes precedence during these years. The eye is left behind. The eye remains stationary. This is difficult to understand because we cannot imagine that something remains stationary in time while time progresses. But that is how it is. The eye remains stationary, and it remains stationary because it does not actually unite with what approaches human beings during their earth existence, but remains united with those forces which we call ours in the spiritual world. The eye remains. The eye basically retains the form in which it was given to us, as we know, by the spirits of form. This eye is kept in the spiritual world. It must be kept in the spiritual world, because otherwise we would never, as human beings, during our earth development, be able to achieve the original task and original goal of the earth. Everything that human beings go through because of the atom part of their nature, of which they carry an imprint into the grave when they die as Adam, that adheres to the physical body, etheric body and astral body, emanates from them. The I waits, waits with everything it contains, for the whole time that the human being spends on earth only looking toward the future development of the human being, until Human beings pick it up again when they take the return path after they have passed through the portal of death. In other words, we remain, I mean that in a specific sense, with our eye in the spiritual world, as it were. Humanity should develop an awareness of that. And it could only become aware of that because at a certain time Christ came down from the worlds to which human beings belong, the spiritual worlds, and as we know, prepared in the body of Jesus in dual form, which was to serve him as a body on earth. If we understand ourselves in the right way, we will always look back to our childhood for the whole of our life on earth, because the spiritual part of us was left behind in childhood. We will always look back at that if we have understood the matter in the right way. And humanity should be educated to look at the thing to which the spirit from the heights can say, quote, Let the little children come unto me. Close quote. Not the human being who is linked with the earth, but the little children. Humanity was to be educated in this respect by being given the festival of Christmas, which was added to the mystery of Golgotha. Otherwise, the latter would only have been needed to be given to humanity in respect of the last three years of Christ's life when Christ occupied the body of Jesus of Nazareth. This festival shows how Christ prepared the human body in childhood. That is what should underlie what we feel about Christmas. Knowing how human beings have always, have actually always remained connected through what remains behind as they grow up, what remains in the heavenly heights with what is now entering. The form of the child is there to remind human beings of the divine part of being human from which they have become separated by descending to earth but which in turn has come to them. This childlike element is what human beings were to be reminded of. It was not particularly easy, but precisely the way in which this cosmic festival of the child, the Christmas festival, came to appearance in the regions of Central Europe illustrates its wonderfully supportive power. What we saw today was only a small one of the many Christmas plays, of the kinds of Christmas plays from ancient times which I spoke about. A number of the so-called paradise plays have remained which are put on at Christmas and where the story of the creation is performed. The connection with the shepherd's play and the three kings' play, bringing their gifts, has remained. Very many of these things were alive in many different plays. Most of them have now been lost. 
the mid-18th century is the period when they begin to disappear in rural areas. But it is wonderful to see how they were alive. Carl Julius Schroer, whom I have told you about many times, collected such Christmas plays in the 1850s in the western regions of Hungary, in the areas around Bratislava and from Bratislava down toward Hungary. Others collected such Christmas plays in other regions. But what Carl Julius Schroer discovered at the time about the traditions associated with the performance of these Christmas plays can touch our hearts particularly deeply. Handwritten versions of these Christmas plays were kept by certain families in the village and were considered to be something particularly sacred. They were put on in such a way that as October approached, thought began to be given as to how to prepare for their performance in front of the farmers of the village at Christmas. Then the most courageous lads and lasses were selected and during this period as they began to prepare themselves, they stopped drinking wine, drinking alcohol. They were not allowed to engage in fighting on a Sunday, which was otherwise permitted in these places, or engage in other excesses. They really had to live a chaste life, as they say. And so an awareness was created that a certain moral mood of soul was required in those who were engaged in the performance of such plays during Christmas. Such plays should not be performed with a normal worldly consciousness. Then they were performed in all the naivete with which farmers can perform such things. But the whole performance was governed by a profoundly serious attitude, an infinitely serious attitude. The plays which Carl Julius Schroer in his time and before him Weinholt and others collected in various regions all have this profoundly serious attitude with which the mystery of Christmas was approached. But it was not always like that and we need to go further back than a few hundred years to find that things were different and to come across something very remarkable. Particularly, particularly the way in which the Christmas plays established themselves in Central European regions, how they arose and gradually developed, can show us the overwhelming effect of the Christmas idea. They were not always received in the way I have just described, that they were approached with awe and reverence, with great seriousness, with an awareness of the significance of the events which lived in the feelings? Oh, no! In many regions it started, for example, by a manger being set up in front of a side altar in some church. That still happened in the 14th and 15th centuries, but it also goes back to earlier times. A manger was set up. That is a stable with an ox and ass inside, and the child and two puppets representing Joseph and Mary. So it was first done with a naive set of figures. Then greater life was to be introduced, but at first by the clergy. Priests dressed up as Joseph and Mary, and they acted out a performance instead of the puppets. At the beginning they even performed it in Latin. This was considered very important in the ancient church, because it appears that a very deep meaning was attached to those watching or listening, understanding as little as possible of the matter, but only observing the outward gestures. But they soon got fed up with that. that. They also wanted to understand something of what was being performed for them. So a start was made in putting some sections into the local language. Then finally a feeling awoke in people that they wanted to be involved and experience it themselves but the whole thing was still quite alien to them. We have to remember that as late as the 12th and 13th centuries, there was no familiarity with the holy secrets of Christmas, for example, which we so much take for granted today. We have to remember that the people heard the Mass year after year, at Christmas also the Mass at midnight, but they did not hear the Bible. That was only available for the priests to read. They only knew individual bits of Holy Scripture, and it was really also to acquaint the people with what had happened long ago that it was performed as a drama by the priests to begin with. They only became familiar with it in this way. Now, I have to say something which I have to request very much that it should not be misunderstood. But it can be said because it corresponds to pure historical truth. 
the involvement in these Christmas plays did not immediately result from some kind of mystery mood or something like that. That's not what it was like. It was the desire to take part in what was being presented to them, to be involved, to act, which brought the people to the plays. And in the end they had to be permitted to be involved. The plays had to be made more comprehensible to the people. Making them more comprehensible was a gradual process. For example, the people did not understand to begin with that the baby lay in the manger. They had never seen that, a baby in a manger. Previously, when they were not allowed to understand anything, they had accepted it. Now, when they were to be involved, the whole thing had to be comprehensible for them. So, only a cradle was put there for them, and the people became involved as they walked past the cradle. Everyone stood next to it and rocked the baby for a while, and so this kind of involvement developed. There were even regions in which things started seriously, but once the child was there, everyone became boisterous and shouted and indicated with dancing and shouting the joy which they felt now that the child was born. It was received in a mood that arose from the desire to be in motion, the desire to experience a story. But the story contained such great, such mighty things that a very profane mood, it was a profane mood at the beginning, gradually developed into the sacred mood which I have just spoken about. The subject itself spread its sanctity over a reception which could not at the beginning be described as holy. It was particularly in the Middle Ages, that the holy Christmas story first had to take hold of the people. And it took hold of them to the extent that they wanted to prepare themselves morally in a very intensive way as they were performing their plays. What was it that captured human feelings, the human soul? The sight of the child, the sight of those things which remain holy in human beings while they're Other three bodies unite with earth development. Even if in certain regions and at certain times the story of Bethlehem took on grotesque forms, it lay in human nature to develop this holy view of the child's nature, a view which is connected with the aspect which entered Christian development right from the beginning. An awareness of how that which remains at rest in human beings when they start on their earth development has to enter into a new connection with that which has combined with the earthly human being, so that human beings give to the earth the wood from which the cross must be made, with which they must enter into a new connection. In the more ancient periods of Central European Christian development, it was actually only the idea of Easter which was widespread among the populace, and the idea of Christmas supplemented that gradually in the way I have described. Because what is written in the Heliant and similar works is the work of individual people, but it was certainly not widespread. The popular aspect of Christmas arose in the way I have just described. It shows in a truly magnificent way how the idea of the connection with the childlike aspect, the pure, true, childlike aspect, which appeared in a new form in Child Jesus, just, uh, excuse me, took hold of people. If we combine the power of this idea with the thought that this idea in the souls is the only one which to begin with can live in our earth existence, then it is the right Christ idea. And thus the Christ idea grows in us. Thus the Christ idea turns into what must gradually grow strong in us, if the further development of the earth is to happen in the right way. Just consider how far human beings are still removed in our present existence on earth from what is concealed in the depths of the Christ idea. A book by Ernst Haeckel, you might have read about it, is being published in these days, titled Ewigkeit, Weltkriegsgedanken über Leben und Tod. Religion und Entwicklungslehre, Eternity, Thoughts in a Time of World War about Life and Death, Religion and Evolutionary Theory. A book by Ernst Haeckel is undoubtedly a book that is the result of a serious love of truth, 
He is undoubtedly a book that most earnestly seeks the truth. The book is said to be roughly about the following. It aims to describe what is currently happening on earth, how the nations are living in war, how they are living in hate with one another, how there are innumerable deaths each day. All these thoughts which impose themselves on human beings in such a painful way are also mentioned by Ernst Haeckel, always against the background of a view of the world as it is seen by him from his perspective. We have often spoken about it because we can recognize Haeckel as a great scientist, even if we are scientists of the spirit. That is, from the perspective, which as we know can also lead to other things, but which leads to what we can observe in the more recent phases of Haeckel's development. Now Haeckel is reflecting on the world war. He too thinks of the blood that is flowing, of the many thing, deaths that surround us. And he poses the question, can religious thought persist in the face of these things? Is it possible to believe in any way, Haeckel asks, that some wise providence, a benevolent God, governs the world, when we see that the lives of so many people are cut short, that they are dying daily by pure chance, as he puts it, through no cause which could in any way be shown to be connected with any wise cosmic governance, but through the chance, as he says, that one might be hit by a bullet or have an accident. Do all these thoughts of wisdom, of providence, have any meaning in the face of such things? Is it not precisely events such as these which prove that human beings simply have to accept that they are nothing more than what externally, materialistically conceived evolutionary history shows us, and that basically it is not wise providence, but chance which governs all earth existence? Is it possible to have any religious thought, Heckel thinks, than to resign oneself, to tell oneself that we simply give up our lives and are absorbed into the great universe? But if this universe, we can ask further, Heckel does not go on to do so, if this universe is nothing more than the interplay of atoms, does this life of human beings really give meaning to earth existence? As I said, Heckel does not go on to ask this question, but he gives the answer in his Christmas book. It is precisely events of the kind which touch us so painfully now. It is precisely such events which show that we have no right to believe that benevolent providence or wise cosmic governance or anything of the kind is interwoven with and living in the world. So, resignation and acceptance that this is simply how things are. Also a Christmas book, a Christmas book which has very honest and sincere intentions. But this book will be based on a significant preconception. It will be based on the preconception that we must not seek meaning in the world by spiritual means that humanity is prohibited from searching for meaning by spiritual means. If we only look at the external course of events, we will not see any meaning. Then it is as Haeckel thinks, and we would have to accept that life has no meaning. Haeckel thinks we should not look for meaning. In contrast, could not another person come and say, quote, if we only keep looking at current events in such an external way, if we only ever keep pointing out the countless bullets that strike people at this time, if we only look at these things and they seem to be senseless, that precisely shows us that we have to seek their meaning at a deeper level. They show us that we cannot simply seek their meaning in what is happening on earth right now and believe that these human souls will pass away with their bodies. But, that we have to search for what they embark on once they have passed through the portal of death. Close quote. In short, someone else may come who says, quote, It is precisely because no meaning can be found in external events that such meaning must be sought elsewhere, must be sought in the supersensory sphere. Close quote. Is this any different from the same situation in quite another field? Heckel's science can lead anyone who thinks as Heckel does today to deny that our existence on earth has any meaning at all. It can lead people to pro want to prove on the basis of what is happening to such great sorrow today 
that our life on earth has no meaning as such. But if we interpret it in our way, we have, after all, done that quite often, then that same science becomes the starting point for showing the profound, immense meaning in world events that can be deciphered by us. But the spiritual must be at work in the world for that to happen. We must be able to unite with the spiritual. Because people do not yet understand in the fields of scholarship how they can allow the power to act on them which has so wonderfully conquered hearts and souls that a holy perception could arise out of a downright profane one when we look at the Christmas mystery, because scholars have not been able to grasp that, because they cannot yet combine the Christ impulse with what they see in the outside world, it is impossible for them to find any meaning, any real meaning, with regard to the earth. And so we have to say, science itself, with all the great progress it has achieved, of which people today are rightly so proud, is not of itself in a position to lead to a view which can satisfy human beings. In following its paths, it can be interpreted either way, as leading to a lack of meaning or as giving meaning to the earth, just as happens in quite a different field. Let us take external science, which has developed so proudly in the last few centuries, and particularly the 19th century to the present day, with all its wonderful laws. Let us take everything that surrounds us today. It is the product of this science. We no longer burn a night light in the way that Goethe still did. We light and illuminate our rooms in quite a different way. And let us take everything that lives in our souls today through science. It has been created through the great progress in humanity of which humanity is rightly proud. But this same science, how does it work? It works beneficially when human beings develop beneficial things. But today, precisely because it is such a perfect science, it produces the invincible instruments of murder. Its progress serves destruction in the same measure that it serves development. Just as the science to which Heckel has pledged himself can lead to sense or nonsense, so the science which has achieved such great things can either serve development or it can serve destruction. And if this science were left to its own devices, it would produce more and more terrible works of destruction from the same sources from which it brings development. It does not directly contain within itself an impulse which takes humanity forward. Oh, if only people would recognize that, then they would be able to judge this science in the right way. Only then would people know that something has to exist in human development in addition to what human beings can achieve through science. This science, what is it? It is in reality nothing other than the tree that grows out of Adam's grave, and the time will come ever closer in which people will recognize that this science is the tree that grows out of Adam's grave, and the time will come when people will recognize that this tree has to turn into the wood that is the cross of humanity that it can only turn into a blessing when that is crucified on it, which unites in the right way with what lies beyond death, but already lives in human beings here, that to which we look in the holy nights of Christmas, when we experience the mystery of these holy nights of Christmas in the right way, that which can be represented in a childlike way, but which bears within it the highest mysteries. Is it not wonderful that the populace can be told in the simplest way that something has entered which acts on earth through human life, something that must not actually go beyond childhood? It is related to the aspect of which human beings are a part as something transcendental. Is it not wonderful that this preeminently transcendental, invisible part could come so close to human souls in such a simple image, to the simplest human souls? Those with learning will also still have to tread the path trodden by these simple human souls. There was a time in which the child was not depicted as sleeping in a cradle, in a manger, but in which the child was represented as sleeping on a cross. The child sleeping on a cross. 
a wonderfully profound image, completely expressive of the thought to which I wanted to give a rise in which I wanted to have arise in your souls today. And can this thought basically not be expressed in quite simple terms? That it can. Let us then search for the origin of the impulses which face each other in the world today in such a terrible way. Where do these impulses originate? Where do all the things that make life so difficult for humanity today originate? Why do they have their origins? They have their origins in all the things which we only become in the world from the time onward to which we can remember back. If we go further back than this time, we go back to the time when we are called as little children who can enter the kingdom of heaven. In this time nothing originates, nothing lies in human souls of that which is conflict and discord today. The thought can be expressed as simply as that. But today we have to see spiritually that there is something so archetypal in human souls that it goes beyond all human conflict, conflict, all human disharmony. We have often spoken about the ancient mysteries which aimed to awaken in human nature those things which allow human beings to look up to the supersensory sphere. And we see that the mystery of Golgotha placed this supersensory mystery in the arena of history so that all human beings could perceive it. Fundamentally, that which unites us with the true idea of Christ is present in us, truly present, because there can be moments in our life, in a real sense now, not in a metaphorical sense, in which we can bring to life what we have received as children despite everything that we are in the external world in despite of everything that we are in the external world, and we can do so by going back, feeling our way back to our childhood perspective, by looking at human beings as they develop between birth and death, by being able to feel that within us. I lectured publicly about Johann Gottlieb Fichte last Thursday. I could have added something which would not have been fully understood then, which explains much about what li- lived particularly in this, in his own way, pious figure. I could have talked about why he became as special as he did, and I would have had to say, because he retained more of his childlike nature than other people, despite his old age. Such people have more of the childlike nature within them than others. They become less old, such people. Truly, such people retain more of what is present in childhood than other people. And that indeed is the secret of many great people, that they can remain children in a certain sense right into old age, that even when they die, they die as children, expressed relatively, of course, as we have to keep with life. The mystery of Christmas, sight of the divine child who was chosen to become the vehicle of Christ, addresses that which lives as childlike nature in us. We look to him as the child over whom Christ is already poised, who in truth went through the mystery of Golgotha for the salvation of the earth. Let us bear in mind, when we commit the imprint of our higher human being, our physical body, to the earth, that is more than just a physical process. Something spiritual happens as well. But this spiritual event only happens in the right way because the Christ being, who passed through the mystery of Golgotha, has flowed into the earth's aura. We do not see the whole earth in its entirety if we do not see Christ united with the earth since the time of the mystery of Golgotha, Christ whom we pass by like we pass by all supersensory things, if we only feel equipped in a materialistic sense, but whom we cannot pass by if the earth is to have a real, a true meaning for us. That is why everything is dependent on us being able to awaken in us that which opens our view into the spiritual world. Let us turn Christmas into the celebration which it should be especially for us, a celebration which serves not just the past, but which should also serve the future, the future which gradually must bring the the birth of spiritual life to the whole of humanity. Let us unite with a prophetic feeling, the prophetic prescience, that such a birth of the spiritual life must be made accessible to humanity 
that such a great Christmas must influence the future of humanity, must influence the birth of something that gives meaning to the earth in the thoughts of human beings. The earth has objectively received this meaning because the Christ being has united with the earth's aura through the mystery of Golgotha. Let us reflect at Christmas how light has to enter human development out of profound darkness, the light of spiritual life. The embers of the old light of spiritual life that existed before the mystery of Golgotha must die out and it must be resurrected, reborn after the mystery of Golgotha through the awareness in human souls that these human souls are connected with what Christ has become for the earth through the mystery of Golgotha. As the number of people grows who know to grasp Christmas in such a spiritual scientific sense, Christmas will develop a power in human hearts and souls that will retain its meaning at all times. At times when human beings can give themselves over to feelings of happiness, but also in those times in which human beings must give themselves over to that feeling of sorrow which cannot but fill us today when we think of the great suffering in our time. The way in which looking up to what is spiritual can give meaning to the earth has been expressed by a person in beautiful words, which I wish to quote to you today. Quote, what gave my eye the strength to see deformity dissolve away, the nights turn to bright suns, disorder turn to order and decay to life. What through the confusion of time and space guides me safely to the eternal spring of truth, beauty, goodness and delight and therein immerses all my striving for destruction? It is since in Urania's eye the deep, clear in itself, blue, calm, pure flame of light myself I saw since then this I rests deep within me, and it is within my being. The Eternal One lives in my life, sees in my seeing. Close quote. And in a second small poem, quote, There is nothing but God, and God is nothing but life. You know it, I know it, as you do. But how can knowledge be were it not knowledge of God's life? How much, alas, I wanted to devote myself there too, but where to find it? If it flows in some way into knowledge, transformed it is into appearance, mixed up with it, surrounded by its cloak. The cloak clearly rises up before you. It is your eye, capital. Let everything destructible die off. And henceforth only God lives in your striving. See through to what your striving lives beyond. Then you will see the cloak as what it is, and you will see divine life as it is unveiled. Close quote. It is, however, the case that people no longer know how to respond to those who point them to a vision of the spiritual that gives meaning to the earth. It is not only the materialists who do not know how to respond. The others who think they are not materialists because they always have God or Lord on their lips they often do not know either what to make of these guides who point us toward the spiritual. Because what could have been achieved with a person who says, quote, there is nothing but God, everything is God, God is everywhere, everywhere, close quote. The person who said these words, quote, see through to what your striving lives beyond. Then you will see the cloak as what it is, and you will see divine life as it is unveiled, close quote sought God everywhere. He who wants to see divine life everywhere, he could be accused of not admitting to the world, of denying the world. People would call him a denier of the world. Of the world, yes. His contemporaries accused him of denying God and therefore forced his dismissal from university. Because the words I read to you come from Johann Gottlieb Fichte, he in particular is an example of of how what in the mystery of Golgotha and following on from the mystery of Golgotha in the Christmas mystery can resound as an impulse in tones of the soul if it continues to live in the human soul throughout earth existence. This can open up a path 
on which we can find the consciousness in which our own I coalesces with the Earth's I, capital, because the Earth's I is Christ, through which we develop something in the human being which has to keep growing if the Earth is to head toward the development to which it was destined from the beginning. So, in the sense set out once again today, let us allow the idea of Christmas to become an impulse in us, particularly in the spirit of our spiritual knowledge. Let us attempt by looking up to this idea of Christmas not to see the senselessness of earth development on the basis of what is happening around us, but let us also see something in suffering and pain, in conflict and hate, which ultimately will help human beings to progress, which really does take humanity a step forward. Rather than looking for the causes, which can in any case easily be covered up in the dispute between the parties, rather than looking for the causes of what is happening today, it is more important to cast our eye, E-Y-E, on possible effects, those possible effects which we have to think of as healing, as bringing healing to humanity. The nation, the people, will do the right thing which is capable of turning what can grow out of the blood-soaked soil into something healing for the future of humanity. But something healing for humanity will only arise if humanity can find the way to the spiritual worlds, if people do not forget that there must not just be a Christmas on a specific date, but a lasting Christmas, a lasting birth of the divine spiritual in physical human beings on earth. Let us enclose the sanctity of this thought in our souls, particularly today. Let us hold it over the Christmas period, which can also be a symbol for us in its outward course of the developing light. In these days, this season, there will be darkness, Darkness on earth to the maximum extent that can happen here on earth. But while earth is living in such profound outer darkness, we know the earth's soul is experiencing the light of Christmas, is beginning to keep watch to the greatest extent. The Christmas period is associated with the time of spiritual watchkeeping, and this time of spiritual watchkeeping should be linked with a commemoration of the spiritual awakening of earth development through Jesus Christ. That is why the consecrated Christmas festival is set specifically at this time. Let us unite the idea of Christmas with our souls in this cosmic and at the same time earthly and moral sense. And then, strengthened and invigorated, let us, to the extent that we can, look at all these things with this idea of Christmas in mind, desiring that events proceed in the right way but also desiring what is right for the course of those things which are developing out of the actions of the present time. And in starting immediately to make active in our souls what we can absorb from this Christmas festival as strength, we look once again to the spirits protecting those who have to bear the brunt of the great events of our time in hard places. Quote, spirits of your souls, active guardians, May your wings bear the beseeching love of our souls to the human beings on earth committed to your keeping. That, united with your power, our prayer may radiate in help to the souls it lovingly seeks. Close quote. And for those who have already passed through the portal of death in this time of grave human tasks, as a result of the great demands of the present, let us say these words once more in the following form. Quote, Spirits of your souls, active guardians, may your wings bear the beseeching love of our souls to the human beings in the spheres committed to your keeping, that united with your power our prayer may radiate in help to the souls it lovingly seeks. Close quote. And the spirit who went through the mystery of Golgotha, the spirit who announced his coming for the salvation of the earth and for progress in what human beings will increasingly also learn to understand the Christ mystery to be. May he be with you and your grave duties. The end of Lecture 1